This is Ortho Tomeo with Dr. S.W. Kibler. That's me. So I'm going to start with just a little uh, kind of a brief introduction, and then we're going to jump right into the, the, the study of the, the biblical text. But some of you might be wondering what Ortho Tomeo is, and what it is is the Greek word that's translated as rightly dividing or rightly handling. And it refers to rightly dividing or rightly handling the word of God or the word of truth. We find this in 2 Timothy um, chapter 2, verse 15. It says, uh, do your best to uh, present yourself to God as one approved, the worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling, rightly dividing the word of truth. Or the tomeo actually means to cut straight. Right? So that is what we're going to do. That's why we call this straight talk about the biblical text. However, you might want to prepare yourself for a possible uh, faith shake. That's what I call a crisis of faith. Um, because what the biblical text actually says is not always what we have been taught and told by many churches and denominations. But it is the word of God. We need the truth. We need the truth as it is found in the inspired biblical text. That way we have a better glimpse into the past. We can better understand the present and we can better determine the future and then how we are to respond in this life that we live here on planet Earth. We need to know the truth. So we can stand on the truth. So we can speak the truth. So it's my intention to present this material in bite-sized chunks. I don't want to go over 30 minutes. And that's going to allow you to, uh, time to think about what has been covered and to do your own research and study. Right. So learn to ask questions. Uh, I consider myself a learner. There was a time that I was... Uh, pupil and I was instructed. Uh, over time I learned to become a learner uh, by asking questions and then finding the answers to those questions. Right. So it's uh, one thing to be instructed, it's another thing to learn. So I encourage you to become a learner as well. Learn to ask questions and then learn to find the true answers by doing your own study, your own research. So learn to ask questions and learn to learn. So we're going to begin at the beginning. Of course, what I'm referring to is the beginning, not only of the biblical text, but the beginning of the beginning, <laughs> the beginning of everything. We'll be looking in Genesis chapter one, and we're gonna read uh, just uh, several verses here. We're gonna read five verses from chapter one, the first five verses. Um, but we will not get through all five verses today. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and he saw that it was good. And God separated the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. As we look at the beginning of the beginning, it seems um, that that has never been questioned, whether there was a beginning. Um, it, remotely, there may be some who don't believe that there was a beginning. Even those who don't believe in the, you know, and hold the biblical text as true, they know there was a beginning of our universe, and they called it the Big Bang. It had to come from somewhere. So it's not so much <clears throat> a question about the beginning or not. The questions arise about the mechanism of the beginning. How did it happen? What, and the two main branches of thought try to answer the question, was it purposeful or was it coincidental, right? So it's about the mechanism of the creation, the beginning. Was it on purpose or was it coincidental? Then the other question that arises is when 
right? The timing of the beginning. So that's where I'm going to start, is with the timing. And to me, the timing of the beginning is moot. It doesn't really matter, and I'll tell you why. Time as we know it did not exist before there was time. Okay, that sounds redundant. Time didn't exist before there was time, but there was a point that time did not exist. Because time is limited to space, that is the physical dimensions of height, length, width, and time is a measurement of the distance. That's what time is. On Earth, time is a measurement of the distance of the travel of this planet and its orbit around the sun, along with the measurement of its own revolution on its axis. That's where we get our days and nights. And this is where we get the months and years, right? And then that's further broken down into uh, minutes and seconds and so forth. But even on other planets, that same standard, if you use it, time is different because the other planets, they don't rotate on their axis at the same speed that the Earth does. Some are faster and some are slower. So some, what we call days, are going to be much shorter. And other planets, the days are going to be much longer. And it's the same with their orbit around the sun. Right? Some planets, their, their orbit around the sun is faster than that of the Earth. Therefore, their years are going to be shorter. And other planets, the rotation around the sun and the solar system takes longer. So their years are going to be much, much longer than the Earth year. Right? Because everything's at a different rate. So time, as we confine ourselves to it, or we are confined to it, is that time on Earth. Because that's where we are. Right? So time is relative to where you are. That's the truth. Time is relative to who you are. So if there was a point that time didn't exist because there wasn't light to even measure days or nights, was there time? Hmm. And then does time really exist outside the solar system? Does time as we know it exist outside of even the physical realm of this earth? How can we measure time in different places? Some say, oh, well, we use um, the speed of light to measure great expanses of distance, right? Between planets and between the solar system and other solar systems. However, research has shown that the speed of light has not remained constant. So if you don't have a constant, how can you measure with it? If your measuring stick is always changing, how are you gonna know how long or how fast, right? So there's a lot of these questions that are they're really unanswerable. But what we do know is that within this realm in which we live, height, length, width, we have time. And that's been fixed. And we'll see that that was fixed by creation itself or by the creator but what if you're outside of these four dimensions what if you're not locked into these four dimensions of length height width and time right here on earth what if you're god what if you're god okay is god bound by height length width and time is he part of this earth is he is he held captive by what's been created? No. The dimension where God lives is different. Time is not relevant to that dimension. So that's something we need to think about. If God is eternal, there is no time. Because the definition of eternity is no beginning and no end. No beginning and no end. It's, not, it's more than forever. Forever insinuates there's a point, a starting point, and then it continues on and never stops. Eternity indicates there's no beginning or end. That's the dimension where God resides. Time is not relevant to him. Matter of fact, we find this in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 8. It reads, but do not overlook this one fact. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, 
that doesn't make sense in our dimensions in height length width and time that we understand here but it makes total sense in the dimension where god resides where he is see there's no comparison time is relative now as we look at the biblical text we're going to be imposed you know, in time because that's going to be part of creation but looking at that point of time before there was light there wasn't time so trying to fix the beginning at a point in time is ridiculous it's, it's uh, unable to be done because there was no way to measure distance because there wasn't anything to measure it against and nothing to measure it with so that's why I think time is a very relative thing. And we make it very important, but it's not as important as we would like to think it is. Right? Um, so for the concerns of the biblical text, the time was always known as part of the original creation on earth. On earth. And we see that mentioned as, as the first day in the, in the text that we read, the first day. And um, our time is constrained by the physical features and natural laws of the earth and this solar system, right? So maybe some of you have heard, and we're going to talk a little bit about time here. Maybe some of you have heard of what's called the gap theory. And the gap theory is, states that there is a gap in time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. So that is between and god created the heavens and the earth gap the earth was formless and void that there was a a period of time between genesis 1 1 and 1 2 and that is that the earth had been formed had form and was not void that it was inhabited right the problem with that theory is it's not in the biblical text there's no room for it in the construction of the sentence that makes up Genesis verses 1 and 2. Right? There's, there's no room for it. Even in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, there's no room for that kind of a gap between Genesis 1 and 2. Because there is no time. That's number one. There's no time yet because light had not come into existence in the biblical text so there's no measurement so there's no time so you can't insert something into nothing right and measure it and say well that's what what the gap theory is 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 it it's it's uh it's the way that some want to account for prehistoric uh creatures that are encapsulated in rock and they have become rock themselves right and I'm speaking, of course, of the fossils, the fossil record. The gap theory is an attempt to accommodate what's called uniformitarianism. And that's a, a, a geologic doctrine. And basically what it says is that there are the stratas that are laid down, they're consistent. And you can assign ages to the various strata. So if anything is found here, it's this many million years old. If it's found here, it's this many million years old. If it's found here, it's this many million years old. So the deeper you go, the longer the period of time that that, that, that creature was encapsulated in, in, in the rock. The problem is, is there's no way to prove those dates because there's nothing that can really date rock back that far right so the dates are, are a lot of assumptions made based on not wanting to believe the biblical text number one that's why within uniformitarianism that's where you find this accounting of millions and millions of years in the fossil record and so forth so the gap theory tries to take another theory called evolution and darwinism and uniformitarianism and make a theory out of a theory that it belongs between verses one and two. Okay. The problem is anytime you have to put something, you have to force into scripture, right? It's not there. <clears throat> so you want it to be. So you take something that's not from scripture and in scripture, and then you try to insert it somewhere. It's wrong. 
right? That's called eisegesis. Eisegesis. It's wrong. You don't put into scripture what's not there, especially if the construction of the 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 grammatical construction and the language construction doesn't allow for it, right? and that's what the gap theory does. So uh, it, it just it doesn't fit, right? It doesn't fit. And why would you want to read into the biblical text a theory that is anti-biblical? Right? Why would you want to read into the biblical text something that's anti-God? Why would you want to read into text something that's anti-Christ? Well, we shouldn't. We should never manipulate God's word to accommodate our opinion or a theory. Right? God's word is to influence our thoughts, our opinions, and then how we interpret the world in which we live. Right? It's the other way around. Theories are not to influence scripture. Scripture is to influence our thoughts. So it might become evident that the gap theory, in my opinion, is not correct simply by the biblical text itself. It doesn't fit there. Some, you just can't, you can't even force it in there. Um, so we go back to the biblical text. We go back to the first verse and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Wow. That one statement in the biblical text has spawned more controversy, right? Especially during the past several hundred years, uh, particularly around uh, what 18, uh, 1870s and so forth under uh, Darwin and, and that clan. And although the idea of evolution has its roots much, much earlier than that, all the way back to 500 and the 500 BCs, around the middle of the 500 years BC. Um, and that was uh, Thallus of Miletus, he lived at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's when, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar is accounted in in the biblical record when uh, the Jerusalem was uh, destroyed and the temple was destroyed. Right at that point in time, um, the the uh, non-Jews, right, those who didn't believe in the biblical text, um, they were trying to explain how things came into being, and what they determined back then, and it's it really hasn't changed a whole lot, is that what uh, nature, everything in nature can be explained by what it's made of, right? What, what the elements that it's composed of. So anything that, that is made or has form, right? It can be explained by, by what it's made of, the elements that it's constructed. And that how it became constructed is through self-assembly. That is by chance, Randomly, things came together, bam, and that's, so you can explain things by what elements came together and that that came together randomly or self-assembly. So that whole idea really hasn't changed over uh, time. It's been built on this idea of you know, Darwinism and evolution and then the uh, uniformitarianism. And it's all been built on that, and, but the idea the idea that all things in nature, this visible cosmos, began as a random act of spontaneous generation or self-assembly has always been rejected in the biblical text. So, that is our stance. The biblical text indicated, it tells us, God created no random acts, no self-assembly, right? no spontaneous generation. God created, it was on purpose, it was planned, it was definitive. Now, you're going to have to take that by faith. In fact, whatever you believe about the beginning or about the original creation, <clears throat> whether you believe in the biblical text or you think the biblical text is completely wrong and there's another answer, such as Darwinism or uniformitarianism, Right, uh, evolution, uh, Big Bang, whatever you believe, right? You're going to have to take it by faith because there's no empirical evidence on either side that's going to prove the point. There's no evidence, tangible evidence, there's no empirical evidence that proves the beginning was purposeful or proves that it was coincidental. There's no proof. You have to take it by faith, whatever you're going to believe. 
humanistic scientists who don't believe in the don't believe the biblical text right they don't want to admit that evolution or darwinism or uniformitarianism they don't want to admit that their belief is a belief as the belief systems they want you to think and they teach their belief system as though it was fact right but it's not because the facts aren't there there's no empirical evidence you can't go back to the beginning and watch it happen it's impossible so they try to explain their agenda their presupposition that god didn't create so they try to gather evidence to show us god didn't create but it doesn't prove the point neither is there evidence that uh, empirically proves that god did create you have to take it by faith right so you choose where you're going to place your faith right that that's what i want you to get out of this uh video today you have to choose where you're going to place your faith right it's it's not so much that your present is determined uh, by this but it's evident that your future is your future is predicated on where you place your faith right and we believe that we are to place our faith in the biblical text in god's word and it tells us that we are to believe place our faith in the one known as the creator god who we also know as yeshua who more commonly is referred to as Jesus the Christ. And it tells us by him all things were created, both the visible and the invisible. We're going to be looking at that uh, probably in the next video. But you have to choose where you're going to place your faith. So this has been Orthotomeo, straight talk about the biblical text. And I am Dr. S.W. Kibler, and I want to encourage you know the truth, stand on the truth, and speak the truth. God bless you.